The inshore fisheries of St. John are unique in that they have coexisted for generations within a highly industrialized port city. As the industry has changed in St. John, so has the fishery. The inshore fishery, recognized by its versatile small fishing boats and multi-species license holders, has undergone many changes over the past hundred years. It remains today a valued traditional way of life and a significant part of our region's heritage. Fishing in St. John Harbor has been an important mainstay for many families. However, while the fisheries and shipping industry have coexisted for over a century, there is a growing concern that industrial developments are slowly displacing the local fishermen from their traditional fishing grounds. Roger Hunter is one of the many fishermen who fish along the St. John coast. He docks his boat in Mizpeck Harbor and lives less than five minutes away. Around the corner from this peck, a liquid natural gas project, LNG, is being constructed. In this area, it is becoming more and more difficult for fishermen to travel to and from their fishing grounds. John McDade is a fisherman from St. John Harbor. He and 10 other fishermen tie up at Floating Wharf on the west side of the river. During the spring and summer months, there's a fishery for shad and gasparo as they migrate up the river. Shad is sold for consumption, and along with Gasparo, it is also popular for lobster bait. St. John is an important area to many fishermen, and has been for generations. In the spring lobster season, up to 75 boats come to fish here from all over southwest New Brunswick. Each of these boats employing two to three people. There are also over 20 boats that dock in the three St. John Wharfs, Mispec, St. John Harbor, and Lornville. David's boat, Lorene and I. This is little salmon. This is when he used to fish at Martin Head. And one spring he decided he wouldn't bring his traps all the way home to repair them and take them back up again. So we went in there for the spring and, and put them all up on the beach and we worked at them for about a month there. That's when he was lobster. And this is when, when he was salmon fishing. I bring them home and uh, take orders from all the restaurants in St. John, and I'd clean them and weigh them and put them in my car. Didn't have a truck then. <laughs> Between the three kids and I, we sold them all over St. John. This was a salmon fishing village. You notice an old church in the hill. When you're coming up, you had looked up the old church. There's a salmon on the church. It's everybody. If they didn't catch salmon, the minister wouldn't get nothing in his collection. <laughs> <laughs> what the 
busy shop all winter. He had a stove in here. We keep it warm. He'd go to the woods and cut the trees, and then he'd take it to the mill, and they'd mill it to what he wanted. And and he used to have all this wire. He making wire traps. Making wire traps. And there's his rope. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is, what was that for? That was for making side heads. Side heads. All kinds of heads hanging in there too. Oh, look at that. All his work. <laughs> Well, that, I started fishing before 1939. I used to fish the Narrows, which for, was for salmon. But then I went up river after that and fished uh, Gaspero through the ice, Gaspero in the spring. Then I started fishing eels. I fished so many years here, so many years here, because nobody else was fishing in the river. So I had it all to myself, really. Well, all that was advertising for prices for the week. Yeah. He has all the price lists, eh? That's what he sent around. You'd be more interested to look at the stuff around it than you would the prices. Fed <laughs> <laughs> uh, stores, Main Street, stores on Union Street. Fed fish stores. Harbor was all kinds of fishermen. Chesley Place, Chesley Street, all Chesley Street, they fish from there, and, and uh, West Side, all the West Side fish from there. We're all free access, you could go in and out, you know, whenever you want to. You fished in all the piers, <laughs> everybody fished. We had a lot of fishermen. <laughs> When I first started fishing, you mean? When I had my diapers on. That's, that used to be A and B and C. Or I used to work there. I worked up there too in the sheds. I worked everywhere in that port over there. Every shed. Well, we got a dollar sixty-five an hour. When we, that was uh, when we, back how many years ago? A big money. And like flour in your back all day. Yeah. Well, you had a, what they call you, you had a weak mind and a strong back. When I started fishing, I built my first boat in the woods. And I put and made traps and I took my rowboat out and put them out there. And I used to fish out of Andy's Cove and I used to row down a mile and a half, which is nothing, is nothing towards the old fellas. They used to row from where Roger lived there, up a ways and roll around to the Cape and haul traps there and then roll back again. They used to roll, but the old people used to roll. That was back, what, 150 years ago or so? They rode it all. And they used to have some kind of a pole they put up in the boat in a little sail and help them, when they get around the Cape, it helped them take them up, up, they didn't have to roll then. We made wooden traps. And uh, we had, uh, twine that you had to dip in the tar to keep them from rotting. 25 cents for lobster license. Yeah, a lot of difference now. Mm. 25 cents for the license and 45 cents a pound for lobsters. If you could sell them. Mm -hmm. Greg Thompson is a fisherman from Dipper Harbor and president of the Fundy North Fishermen Association. This is uh, St. John River coming out, uh, St. John Harbor. This is where our uh, Canaport uh, buoy is. This is where our LNG terminal is going in. 
and uh, the fishery, uh, the lobster fishery is conducted all across this area actually it comes right out uh, down the shipping lanes uh, right across this whole area is, is heavily lobster fish when the salmon fishery used to be on the best place was about a few miles offshore the salmon used to run up across uh, this way is, is the area they used to fish the salmon in and right up into the harbor there was some long lining done up off Miss Speck uh, there was a lot of long lining done down in, in this area. Uh, at one time, uh, there was a lot of uh, codfish offshore, uh, but that was quite a few years ago, probably the late 70s. There's a, a scallop bed here off the buoy as well, and people uh, regularly drag scallops uh, uh, off in, uh, in this area. The Gaspar Old Fishery has always been uh, uh, up inside of Partridge Island here. Um, right now, lobsters is the uh, mainstay of the inshore fishery. Uh, we also fish scallops, we fish ground fish, uh, we fish herring. There are a few, uh, uh, you know, as I say, in the harbors, uh, they fish some Gaspar uh, there's a, a small uh, rock crab fishery, a uh, uh, little sea urchin fishery. Uh, uh, they're trying to develop uh, coal hogs. You know, there are a few small fisheries, but, but uh, lobster, scallops, herring, and ground fish are the, really the, the big four, and at the moment, lobster is king. On the water, it is common to see father and son teams lobster fishing, as the inshore fishery has always been a family business. Crew members are often family, and licenses are passed down from one generation the next. The lobster fishery also has many conservation regulations, several of which were designed by fishermen themselves. All small lobsters are thrown back, and buried lobsters female lobsters with eggs are returned to the ocean. That's a buried lobster? It's a buried lobster, yeah. That's the future. Today, lobster fishing provides a good income and benefits many other businesses, from seafood buyers and truck drivers to hardware stores and fishing gear suppliers. When we talk about industry to a fisherman, it's, uh, it's also access. We need uh, large areas to fish in to make it uh, economically viable. The number one concern is the loss of, of bottom. With, uh, with LNG, there has been talk that uh, there may be a, a safety exclusion zone required. This is a great concern to fishermen that does every development that come along have to exclude fishermen from a certain area, uh, big or small. We've, we've gone from a, uh, an oil refinery that's probably 60,000 60, barrels, now it's 300,000 barrels, and that's just doubled and tripled in, in shipping 
Uh, we've got an LNG project, which is going to add another 120 ships to our to our area. We got uh, uh, a second oil refinery that's going through an EA here now, which it's, it's it looks like it's going to go 75 percent chance of, of going ahead. That would be a 900 percent increase in shipping traffic. We, I just heard announcement today on a potash in Sussex, and they deliver all the potash through the port of St. John. So that's probably another 50, 60 ships. We're getting squeezed, and uh, we can we, we're feeling the pressure now. To that piece of bottom up there, that where we catch our lobsters, is going to be gone. This is where we tie our boats. The Mispec Wharf is in the mouth of the Mispec River, and we fish down this coast, right along the shore. Now this is where the LNG terminal is going to be. It's right, right here, which makes us deviate from this lane out around this way when there's no ship here when there's a ship there and a ship here then the deviation becomes much larger than that out around because this is not this is a half a mile exclusion zone around the SBM but this this little line here is only the uh, swing of the uh, floating pipe on top of the water so it's actually bigger than that. So the deviation then becomes quite, quite big to get in around this. We do pretty good up around that area. Time you put 40, 50 traps up around through there, maybe more than that a lot of times. And that's right where they're going to be, so I'm going to lose all that. What happens is when when, when a city's growing, and it's in this city is a port city, which means a lot of shipping coming in and out, we get uh, we we get high volume of gear loss. It's mostly the lobster industry that has the uh, the impact because we have buoy gear and we have the lines and buoys on the surface, which the the ships and the tugs cut off when they when they go past them. I lose, on an average, I would say now uh, anywhere between 30 and 60 traps a year. At $150 a trap, you know, when you're including, a, a, you know, right from $100 a trap, then you include ballast, rope, and buoys, it's easily $100, $150, and then you're, then you're experiencing the, uh, the tag that you have on that trap is lost, so we probably to try to get that tag back to able to get it uh, through the DFO and it's just it's such a hassle that a lot of times you don't even bother. We have a lot of safety concerns with these two projects as well. I mean, we'll look at it today. Dense fog conditions. A lot of springs we fish up there day after day after day in, in dense fog conditions and it's, it's, it's a hard job up there now to fish with the ship traffic that's there. Increase it eight or nine hundred percent. See what, see what it's going to do to you. Is it, is it really going to be safe to go there? You may get run down or run over. I mean, there's a lot of boats that fish that area in the spring of the year, like outside, and it's going to be a bad situation. When you get into these heavy traffic areas, it's uh, it's complicated for everybody, especially in the fog. And uh, and if your nerves are uh, not made out of steel, you're uh, you might rather fish somewhere else in 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 those those days. Uh, there's always uh, always conflicts about space, uh, wherever the fishery is, and uh, you know the new uh, security issues around. Uh, uh, harbors, uh, international ports or whatever uh, is causing a lot of uh, havoc at the present time among our fishers in St. John because they have difficulty just uh, knowing where they can tie up. I guess in December, December the 28th, it was actually my birthday, 2005. I was going in the gate at the port that morning and I was passed a, a piece of paper saying it was a notice that uh, all commercial fishermen and their 
gear, boats, and all what they call ancillary equipment was to re be removed from port property as of January 15, 2006. There was no consultation process, there was nothing. It was just a blanket, uh, get out. That's done, you know. After having been there for, you know, as long as that port's been there, probably more. If you, if history be known, if you went back and looked at it. If you've gone to any other different areas in, in the world, I guess San Francisco's one, they get a place called Fisherman's Wharf. That's exactly what it is, it's Fisherman's Wharf. You know what I mean? You can get down there and there's restaurants on it and you can overlook the fishermen doing doing what they do, you know, loading bait, unloading fish, doing whatever. Eastern Passage in Nova Scotia, you know, is another one. Bar Harbor in, in Maine, you know what I mean? The two, the two entities work together. I, I'm speaking of the commercial fishermen and the recreational boaters. They work together and, you know, it can be done. I guess it was a it was a people's port, and as certain people like to say now, it's still a people's port, and it, nobody should be excluded. You know, people, especially people that earn a living there and derive a living from commercial fishing. So there is more than people are aware of impacts to people that that. Uh, have never even been thought about, you know, and that's one of them. That, that the impacts to my private life, my personal life, that that uh, you know, I can't sit down and have a discussion with someone anymore, or just talk about the weather or, or whatever. It this always comes up. It, it's always there in the backs of people's mind of what this thing is going to actually do to them. And sad state of affairs. I'll tell you that. Miss Beck and Redhead is mostly family. Everybody knows one another. You've got a sister that lives there, or a sister-in-law, or a brother-in-law, or something that lives either in Miss Beck or Redhead. Now those people are, are, they don't want to be there. So, on my wife's side, two of her sisters have now sold their homes up there. And one moved to Chris Pam Sis, and the other one's gone building a house now Lock Bowman Road somewhere, but that that side of the coin never even got looked at. Like the the, the your own personal life, private life, has been impacted by this these projects. You know, I guess the the part that ticks me the most about it all, and I don't have any. I'm not against this refinery. I wasn't against the LNG being built, even though I live a mile across the water from it. It's that you can't get anyone to listen to your concerns. The government doesn't listen. You know, we, we met with them, we talked with them, and it goes in one ear and out the other. It's it's the, the bottom line is, I've been there all my life. I fished there all my life. I've a license to fish there, and so does everyone else. Why is someone like these, these companies allowed to come in and just set up shop and not have to deal with fishermen. I, 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 it just amazes me that, that they can do this. I guess what what any commercial fisherman that I know of and, and fish alongside or fish with, that all they want to do is, uh, you know, come to a common understanding or common agreement that there's two entities there, commercial fishermen and commercial shipping. It's a common resource called the Bay of Fundy. We both derive a living from it, and the idea of it is to share it, and to share it to, that, that both sides can get, you know, can carry on their business. That's all it is. But so far as if if one one entity is going to come in and try and shove another out, that doesn't that doesn't that all that creates is friction and confrontation. The best way to go about it is to sit down and, and come to a, a working arrangement or working agreements. Because, uh, as I've said all along, commercial fishermen don't want anybody's money. They want to go fishing. How do we sight in this stream? What we do is we pick a spot on a map and say, I think we'll put it there. We need to look more at an area and see what is the situation in this area. And if we're going to put an industry in this area, where in this area would it fit in best and allow the 
you know, the fish to do their thing and the fishermen to do their thing, uh, rather than say, we're going to put it right here, we're going to spend a million dollars to study this spot and put it there, regardless if we moved it a quarter mile, everybody would be totally happy. Early in May, we installed the LNG traffic high flyers that identified a, a shipping traffic lane for ingoing and outgoing uh, vessels, which would include Atlantic towing, harbor pilots, tugs and barges, and traveling to and from the LNG site to the uh, city limits. And any of the traffic that would be coming from barges carrying uh, jackets and structural uh, material up from the states or Newfoundland where this stuff's coming from. Uh, we used uh, the lane that Bay Ferries, as you can just see over here, the, the Bay Ferry lane, uh, the traffic, the, the, the tugs and everything fo would follow that lane to a uh, point that would uh, about where she's at now and then they would turn in and go into the off into Miss Beck Point. This is the LNG traffic lane that we established. Uh, this is the lane that Bay Ferries use for in to St. John to Digby so we used that and then made a uh, east-west approach off the north-south to the uh, uh, LNG uh, pier. So this is where all the tugs and barges, everybody followed. This, these are the high flyers we installed about uh, 150 to 200 feet away from the, uh, ex uh, the 500 foot traffic lane. And uh, we were allowed to fish this area here and here uh, with, uh, by doing this. Uh, Irving or, and Repsol have uh, committed to a uh, it's called a traffic committee for the uh, St. John Harbor and lo and the user groups and local fishermen and we have sat now in two meetings to discuss uh, lanes and and how we can both coexist and just just being able to sit down at a table and talk with these other users is very important to us because before this We've, we, we, were, we didn't have our comments. We weren't allowed to, uh, to be part of the process. I don't want them to just come along and say, here's where it's going to be. No. I'd like to be a process where that fishermen have a say in, in it too. And I, I think that happened with the shipping lane we had for the, uh, or traffic lane we gave the tugs for the bridles and the traffic for uh, the LNG terminal. We did have a say in that. We told them where we would like to see it go, and that's what they used. And I think that's the way that it, that it should be done. You know, if it's good for them, I mean, it's got to fit both parties. But uh, I, I'm sure that a solution can be found to, to the whole problem of ship traffic. Meaningful consultation, and as far as I'm concerned, meaningful consultation at the end of the day means you come out with a, uh, a way of doing things better a way of uh, respecting each other's uh, way of doing business and uh, the both entities, I mean by that, the commercial fishermen, the commercial uh, shippers, the commercial shipping industry uh, can work side by side and still make a living, both sides. As long as we can sit down and all the user groups t uh, sit down at a, at a table and be able to work out these, then I think we will be successful. It's, uh, it's tough, it, it, does, it won't come easy. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's worth uh, uh, working towards that goal. The fishermen are hopeful that they can build on the small victory of the Traffic Committee. Canada's Oceans Act mandates our government to work towards integrated marine management. That is a process where all stakeholders, fishermen, the shipping industry, government and others, plan wise development. One that allows all to share the waters. This is what the fishermen want for St. John Harbor.